Good evening. I think we're close to 7 o'clock. <laughs> um, my name is Kristen Tollison and I'm the Education Director here at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art and I just wanted to welcome you all to the Poets Laureate event. Um, I like to think that the museum is a place where we can literary arts and visual arts and all kinds of manifestation of art making can coexist and this is just one example of a successful way that that happens. Um, this is a partnership with the Kitsap Regional Library for this program which kind of caps off our month and everyone's month of poetry. Um, so I just wanted to give you a warm welcome and welcome Rebecca Judd who introduced the program. Enjoy. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rebecca Judd. I'm the branch manager of the Bainbridge Island branch of Kitsap Regional Library. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you all tonight for this very special evening of poetry, which, as Kristen mentioned, is being co-hosted by the Museum of Art um, in this lovely space and uh, Kitsap Regional Library. So welcome to you tonight. And we are very fortunate to have two-thirds of the entire roster of the Washington State Poets Laureate here in the house tonight on Bainbridge Island. And I'd like to begin by introducing uh, Sam Green, who was our state's first Poet Laureate from 2007 to 2009. He is a Washington native, currently residing on Waldron Island a distinguished poet and author of several poetry collections, including The Grace of Necessity, which was the winner of the 2008 Washington State Book Award for Poetry. His work has appeared in numerous publications. So for more than 30 years, he has also served as the editor of a small press focusing on the work of Washington State poets. Our second poet laureate, Kathleen Flanagan, just left office in February, although you would never know it by your very busy schedule. <laughs> Raised in Richmond, Washington, and a current Seattle resident, Kathleen holds engineering degrees from Washington State University, and we're hoping she will share her path from engineering to poet laureate tonight. Uh, she is president of Floating Bridge Press, a nonprofit organization dedicated to publishing Washington poets. Her first book, Famous, won the Prairie Schooner Prize in Poetry and was a finalist for a Washington State Book Award. Her second collection, Plume, about the Hanford Nuclear Site, was recently chosen for the Pacific Northwest Poetry Series. So a special thank you to BEMA, the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art, and in particular to TJ Faddis, who is working our sound and our lights in the back there, and Kristen Tollefson, who is the Education Director and helping to host this program. Also to Kitsap Regional Library and Chapel Lagnet, who's put this um, details of this program together. To Jane, who is here with Eagle Harbor Books. And after the program, uh, the bookstore will be selling copies of the poet's work in the back um, of the bistro. And so you're welcome to purchase a book and have it signed by one of the poets. And if you are interested in a double feature of poetry, uh, tomorrow night, the third of the three poet laureates in Washington State, Elizabeth Austin, is going to be at the Sylvan Way branch in East Bremerton at 7 p.m. tomorrow night. So if you would uh, like to join us there, that is also going to be a wonderful program. And now, please help me welcome Sam Green and Kathleen Flanagan. Basic housekeeping. Chapel has been amazing with exchanging emails. I live on Waldron, and Waldron is off the grid. We, I mean, off the grid. We have no power on Waldron. But we have solar panels and trees, and those solar panels bring in just enough electricity to charge batteries so that we have, thanks to uh, satellite, we have email that we can send by kerosene lamp. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> so um, Chapel has been trading um, emails with me and, and has managed to put this together. So thank you. And thank you for having us here tonight. And thanks to Kathleen, who made a special effort to come down here after a busy day in La Connor. <laughs> she drove all the way down here to accommodate the schedule because this was the only day I could be here. So Kathleen, and thanks to Kathleen, too, because you put in a wonderful two years. 
this position is important, and it's because people keep coming that it's going to stay that way, I think. One of the things that uh, I was very careful about as poet laureate was to remind people that it was not about me. It shouldn't be about the laureate. It should be about poetry. The laureate's just the union rep for the rest of us. <laughs> Man, I'm back on the drill press now. <laughs> Somebody else is out dealing with the, you know, the bosses, management. That's wonderful, and that's how it ought to be. But I also think that poets should support one another. So I like to start every reading by reading poems by another poet rather than my own. And there are an awful lot of exciting new books come out in Washington in the last couple of years. So here's a book by uh, Holly Hughes, Sailing by Ravens. And Holly is fairly local, and you know, so here's a poem by her to begin the evening with. Because the sea never forgets that night you whistled on watch opens a thousand windows, slams each door shut. Because the sea is swung by the moon, because the sea parts, but only for Moses, because the sea has no mistress, takes a thousand lovers, takes no prisoners, won't give up the dead. Because the sea never gets lost, promises never to tell, says she loves us equally, but in the end, cares really not at all. I put together a list of um, poets who have put out books since, since 2012, and I sent that list to Chapel. And um, for those of you who we want getting, a copy we're of it, getting it printed, Sam. I think we'll have it. Ah, you'll have a copy, so you can all look at that, and you should run out and buy their books, <laughs> right? Because this is what we do. I mean, poets support poets. I have a brand new book. <laughs> <laughs> Does that sound like a commercial? Right? I didn't mean it that way. I have a brand new book. So I've only read from this once, and, and it's, it's always a strange feeling to be able to have a book in your hand because all of us who write know poets who have manuscripts that deserve publication. And publication is often circumstantial. It's luck. We luck into it, where other people don't have the same luck always. So it's, it's never something to take for granted. So I'm feeling pretty blessed. I graduated from high school at 17, 17 and a half. Um, I joined the United States Coast Guard because I didn't want to go to Vietnam. So I joined to meet girls. <laughs> Big thing in my life in those days. And I got sent to the South Pole first. Um, <laughs> and then I got sent to Vietnam anyway. There were a lot of posties in Vietnam. And when I was there, I was lucky enough to come back in the middle of my tour. Um, if you were a soldier, if you were a Marine, if you were stationed in Vietnam in one of the normal services, you couldn't come back to the United States. They were afraid if you did, you wouldn't return. So everybody got an R&R, &R, but I got to come home. Coming home, coming home from a war, we're seeing this, and maybe some of you know people who have been coming back from Afghanistan or Iraq or some other combat zone, and you know that one of the things they want to do is to be who they were before they left. I don't know anyone who didn't want that. So this is about that. Grandmother cleaning a rabbit. I shot this one by the upper pond of the farm after watching the rings trout made rising to flies, watching small birds pace the backs of cows, hoping all the time it would run. My grandmother told me they damaged her garden. I think it was a way to make the killing lighter. She never let me clean them, only asked I bring them headless to her. I bring this one to the fur block near the house, use the single bitted axe with the nick and the lower crescent of the blade, smell the slow fire in the smokehouse, salmon changing to something sweet and dark. A fly turns in a bead of blood on my boot. I tuck the head in a hole beside the dusty globes of ripened currants, talk quiet to the barn cat. In her kitchen, my grandmother whets the thin blade of her barlow, makes a series of quick 
clever cuts, then tugs off the skin like a child's sweater. This one was pregnant. She pulls out a row of unborn rabbits like those the sleeve of a shirt in a series of knots. The offal is dropped in a bucket. Each joint gives way beneath her knife as though it wants to come undone, as though she knows some secret about how things fit together. I have killed a hundred rabbits since I was eight. This will be the last. I am twenty and about to go back to the war that killed my cousin in Qianhua, which is one more name she can't pronounce. I haven't told her about the dead, and she won't ask. She rolls the meat in flour and pepper and salt and lays it in a skillet of oil that spits like a cat. She cannot save a single boy who carries a gun. All she can do is feed this one. Stroke. Where is the axe, says the ice in the trough, left in the field for the cows? Here, says the file on the bench in the shed, stuck in a hole by the vice. Where is the cup with the chip and its rim, says the sink with its saucer and spoon? Here, says the kitchen linoleum square, in fragments the color of bone. Where is the milk, says the pail on the porch, scalded and shining and warm? Here, say the bells of the shuffling heifers stalled at the door of the barn. Where is the cream for the cinnamon cap, says the tuna can under the stairs? Here, says a shelf in the coal box with the butter and leftover pears. Where is the heat for the dinner, say the skillet and pans on the range? Here, say the split chunks of alder and fir, carefully dried and arranged. Where is the ball made of leftover twine, says the unfinished rug on the stool? Here, says the awkward crochet hook, made from an old-fashioned nail. Where is the woman who lives in this house, say the work coat still, says the work coat still hung on a chair? Here, says the wind through the grass of the field. Here, say the waves on the bay past the bluff. Here, says the breath and the air. Not here, say the cows. Not here, says the cat. Not here, say the boots by the door. Not here, says the stove. Not here, says the coat. Not here, says the shape on the floor. New owner. The new owner is sick and tinker tired, he says, of all us grandkids stopping by just to set foot on the land. She worked and walked, and so what if we offered to prune the orchard the way we know she did? And why would he care a gnat's eyebrow where she kept her, pitch, pitch, her pitchfork, axe, or a rake? And no, we can't check the old hen house for fake eggs we played with, or see if the hidden cowbell is still in the same place. And he doesn't want to see my initials and some girls carved on the bottom of a heart grain beam halfway up the weather side of the barn after she and I slid our itchy bodies out of the bales. And no, <laughs> we can't have that hay hook with the groove her right thumb wore in the handle. No one should have left it there in the first damn place. And he wouldn't give two shits to know where we used to dump the heads and guts of butchered steers over the bluff. And no, we can't go look for skulls. And her berries are long gone. He pulled them out, so don't ask for starts. And forget about hoping to rake smelt on the beach. They don't spawn there anymore. Mm -hmm. And so what if we used to shoot a lot of rabbits? There are still a lot, so we didn't make much of a dent, <laughs> did we? And we <laughs> wouldn't care a starving barn cat's ass less about the name she gave her cows. And why can't we realize it's been two dozen years since she had that stroke and died, and none of this will bring her back? And no, no, 
No. He's never wondered whether anyone, anywhere, will love him for so long. And like that. In a couple of weeks, Sally and I, Sally, whose first book is coming out in one week, first book of poems, in a couple of weeks, Sally and I will have been together 44 years. She was 19. I was 21. She was the girl I wanted to meet when I joined the Coast Guard. <laughs> and I did. At 44 years, when you're 19 and 21, love seems a lot less complicated. Love seems to be about something different. At 44 years, what does it mean to have a long love, to have a long life together? Here's a poem. He said, <laughs> I had it. You probably knew the page. Oh yeah, I know. There, botanical. <laughs> Maybe, at some stage, love includes kneeling in dungarees beside the long time beloved at a stem of Queen Anne's lace, taking the time to dig up a portion of the root, peel it for the carroty smell, point out the umbels that form a cap like the nest of a small bird, a single central flower, the red of a ruby, or a drop of the queen's own blood, how the leaves are like lace. And maybe love includes kneeling again alongside a stalk of yarrow near where the neighbor's goats are tied, the tiny white clusters of blossoms different, you tell him, one old hand guiding the tips of his fingers to the shapes of the leaves, their give and bending. Plumachio soft feathers, telling the tale of Achilles tending the hurts of his warriors with a clever poultice. Staunch weed, you say. Woundward. And maybe this long love contains the nearly certain knowledge that the beloved, though he vows this time to remember, might, in a week, mistake one plant for the other as he has for more than 40 years. <laughs> Such love, tenacious as any weed we might describe, but cannot always name. And one more of these, and then I want to read a long poem to end and turn this over to Kath. We're, the way we're going to do this tonight is that I'm going to read for 20 minutes, she's going to read for 20 minutes, and then we're going to talk to you for 20 minutes, or talk with you, I hope, uh, we hope, because, again, this is about um, a program that serves us all, uh, including us, and we're interested in what you have to say about that, and I hope we can, we can talk about what that means. Kathleen was just up in La Conner. right now it's tulip season. If any of you have driven up into the Skagit Valley, you've seen these amazing fields of tulips. The locals hate it. The locals hate it because, you know, people stop right where it says, don't park. They get out and block traffic. The local kids just despise the tourists. But for anybody who's never seen them, they're amazing. They're incredibly beautiful. I was driving with my friend Tony Curtis, this Irish poet, um, through the valley for the first time. He'd never been to America. He'd never seen this. And we come driving through, and there's this field of red tulips. And he shouts out, stop! the car! <laughs> and I stop right under one of those signs that says, do not park here. And he says, he says, what is that? And I told him, well, they're tulips. I said, you haven't you ever seen them? No, I've never seen anything like this. And so, you know, I called my wife, because I had a cell phone, and I could. So I called Sally. Hi, hon. Are you there already? No, no, Tony and I are stopped. We're looking at tulips. Really? Yeah, they're red. Oh. No, no, they're really red. My, I heard you. Red. They're amazingly red. Okay? Amazing. I, they're, I'll call you back. So I, I was thinking about that, about the problem. How do you say, how do you say something about this to someone who's not listening? Tulip Field, McLean Road. 
If there were a single word for the color of these tulips, it would have to contain the bright swirl of my mother's favorite skirt. She square danced in it for years until some inner joy faded faster than the fabric. It would need to have the scarlet of a single maple leaf caught in a spider's web between two trees in the orchard my wife and I planted together. And the splendor of an apple polished on the wool of a Pendleton shirt my grandfather left a little wear in when he died. I say, red, and want to hold it with my tongue longer than teeth and gums will let me. Skirt and leaf, shirt and apple, and no lexicon to help me. A couple of years ago, I got a call from Director of Artist Trust, um, and she wanted to give a gift to the Washington State Arts Commission to to say something in appreciation for the work the Arts Commission had done for the arts, for the state. And uh, the idea was that the Arts Commission couldn't receive anything whole. They, they couldn't give, her, they give them a painting. They couldn't give them a piece of sculpture. By law, they couldn't have anything tangible. I, I, I still quarrel with this kind of word. So she said, what we thought we'd do is give them a poem. So would you write a poem? And. So I thought about the Arts Commission. The Arts Commission has given me a lot of work over the years and has been tremendously supportive. But I also was thinking about the arts and where the arts exist. And it, it seems to me that m most people forget that the arts are ubiquitous. They're not just in one big place. It's not just Seattle. It's not just Spokane. It's not just it, Olympia. The arts, the arts are what help us see who we are. And they're everywhere. So I took on the task of writing the poem and it rapidly get, began to get big. I gave, I gave the organizers um, a sheet. All of you can take home a copy of this poem. I signed them, printed it off. It's in nine point type. I hope you have better eyes. Than you. <laughs> but it's the only way I could get it on. Because I, I did this crazy thing. I decided to write a besidarium, and a besidarium, and that is a, a poem where the first sound of each stanza is the sound of the letter of the alphabet in order. And I also used Washington place names and cities alphabetically in order for each stanza all the way through. <laughs> it was stupid to try. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I, so I worked it out and I, I got to read the poem. And it was so this is it. I'll end with this. A Bisidarium for the Arts for Arts Wa and Chris Tucker. Let's see. Maybe I can read better without my trifocals. <laughs> oh yeah. A isn't just for art in the abstract, folks, because art is local. It's about shade tree mechanics earning extra cash during hard times after a full day's labor. Jazz or cello solo on the radio of whatever beater they're fixing up, an Anacortes, a Soton, Acme, or Aberdeen. Because it's about still lifes, seascapes, or landscapes on cafe walls in Brewster, Brennan, Battleground, or Blaine, plays or concerts in town halls, city halls, fire halls, school gyms, library basements. It's about volunteers painting scenery for sets on the floors of living rooms, garages, barns, or backyard shops in Camus, Copalis, Kashmir, Clearwater, or Clallam Bay. <laughs> it's about someone blowing or cutting glass, someone on their knees laying out designs for playground pool mosaics, murals on old town walls, on rec center doors in Davenport, Dixie, Deer Harbor, or downtown Duval. <laughs> it's about spoken word in Edison, Grange Hall recitals in Ephrata, cowboy poets in Ellensburg, rappers in high school cafeterias, poems of fisher folk, farm folk, logging folk, and railroad folk from Alma to Endicott, East Sound to Everson. It's about opening the heart with skill and effort and skill. Science fiction, fan fiction, non-fiction, children's fiction, epic fiction, short fiction made and read in Friday Harbor, Fruitvale, Ferndale, Five, Four Lakes, Fall City, and Forks with its dark 
Geography of Rain. <laughs> it's about fiddlers weaving gull cries into strings and Gardner and setting them free in Goldbar, Graylin, Gig Harbor, and Gorst. It's about men and women lugging tired voices into a church where choral notes bless the holy hopes of Monday to Friday shifts in Havelock, Hay, and Hoquiam, Hoodsport, Huntsville, Hatton, and Hartline. It's about someone spending a lifetime trying to paint what the eyes of potatoes see beneath ground, the tarnished gold of wheat beneath the shadow of a crow's wing. It's about potters in Index or Ione, ceramics in Issaquah, the power of glazes to hold and hide light in Ilwaco. It's about joyful vision in Jamestown, Joyce, Jared, and Juanita, oils and canvas, watercolor on rag paper, palette knives, brushes, a thousand strokes for three that finally count. It's about good steel and soft wood, how stone chips or carves away, how molten brass is capable of becoming whatever container holds it till it hardens in Kennewick, Kingston, or Kettle Falls, seabirds at Kalalock, lake trout from Kapowson. It's about hand puppets, shadow puppets, finger puppets, rod puppets, and the nearly human bent elbows and swinging knees of marionettes that act a legend, tell a story, teach a lesson. It's about kids in classrooms, the ones who wonder if they're strange to love what they love in Lillowop, LaConnor, Lacey, LaPush, or Lyman, the ones who each day have the impulse to add the heart into what head and hands can make, the ones who see shapes and how pebbles lie in a stream bed, find their bodies imitating ferns in wind, because Returning vets from Moses Lake, Muckleteo, Morton, Mossy Rock, or Montesano will instinctively sway in their wheelchairs or VA beds when string quartets arrive to play in the wards or sit in writing groups to hunt the words that tell them why and how to say goodbye to their old bodies. Because... And Nia Bay, Natchez, North Bend, Nacelle, Olmach, Oysterville, Olympia, Ording, and Othello, the arts are not some sidewalk politician's powder, a medicine showman's sham, an oily evangelist's come on, a coach's half-time plea, a carney's sideshow pitch. It's what you get up for at 5 a.m. with the cows and hens in P.L., Patterson, Port Orchard, Prosser, or Pullman to make sense of birth, divorce, the early loss of a child, an absent plate at the table. Because it's about teaching us to see as well as look. Because a father cannot haul his son's name from the deep well of age, but can, on cue, recite in tandem a poem they learned together 60 years before. It's about the ringmaster for all five senses, what we taste, smell, touch, hear, and see, in Quilcene, Quinault, Queets, and Quincy. It's about how we find order and ardor. It's a sharpened hoe with a duct-taped handle with which we hold up chaos like a flock of green lake geese. It's the light that comes through the pointed lens in Ritzville, Republic, Raymond, Rock Island, Rosalia, or Randall. And then, escorts truth to the dance floor of color, movement, pattern, shape, and a furthy flirtation with shadow. Because from Sappho to Silcot, Shelton to Soap Lake, we will chisel deer or fish on the flat sides of rocks, beat a limb against a log to find its true heart sound, tease a tune to the hollow bone of a bird, pound soup cans flat to make retables, sketch in wet beach sand with a sharp stick, even with the tide line rising, because from Titan to Tenasket, to Lalip to Tumwater, to Coma to Tohola, it's about you, friends, right there in Uniontown, Underwood, or Union Gap, stepping up to toss the silver coins of your bright attention at the shallow saucers of possibility without guarantee of a prize in your pocket. Because art respects no boundaries, leaps Vivace, off the page, resists the frame, leaves the stage to sit and mingle with the audience, won't stay at the desk where it's told, defies the recipe, shapeshifts, teases, tests, quicksilvers from Vader, Vancouver, and Veravale to Victor, Vantage, and Vashon, and that gets 
double. You better believe it for the hometown cried crowd, because this is home. Winthrop and Washougal, Willapa and White Swan, Walla Walla, Wickersham, Waldron, and Wildcat Lake. It's about 75 towns, 71,300 square miles where folks wake hoping for exaltation, exhortation, and explanation, for examination, excitation, and exemplification. It's about stubborn support of bounty in 39 counties, 206 cities, 75 towns, 243 unincorporated communities like Weimar, Yakima, Yelm, Yakult, and Yarrow Point. It's about doing the job, friends, and then doing it over. Because when the kiln is cool enough to open, the next round of pots is already dreaming of heat. The note of the next song comes from the one just sung. Because in Zenith and Zilla, the first word of the next poem begins with breathing in again. Because every child who chants through the alphabet knows the last letter before A is Z. The last word before the next sermon is Amen. Thank you. break between the two of us. Um, so Sam served as Poet Laureate from 2007 to 2009, and then there was a two-year hiatus. And if you remember, 2009 is when the economy really was difficult in Washington State, and it was um, as a result that the program went into a kind of hiatus, and the state backed off from sort of the bad publicity of giving money to poetry. Um, this actually happened, the governor was accosted at a, at a um, press conference in Spokane and somebody asked her, you mean to say you're actually giving money for a poet laureate program and we have these kind of financial woes and so she backed off, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell the story, but she backed off and um, the program, even though it was unbelievably successful with Sam, it went into this kind of sleep. But because Sam did such an amazing job and it had so much impact over those two years, there was this fire in people's bellies to get it going back again. And so Humanities Washington and Washington State Arts Commission um, found the funds, they found private funding, they found national funding, no state funding, and they <laughs> resurrected the program. And that's why it was available for me to apply and to be, you know, to, to go forward with it. But it was really because Sam did such an amazing job establishing this program, showing what kind of impact it could have for very little money, that we have this program at all again. So I think we all owe Sam a huge debt of gratitude. So I'm, I'm going to read, um, read a couple of poems that remind me of stories um, along the way. Um, the first one I'm going to read to you is, reminds me of a trip I took last November. Um, I was hitting all 39 counties. Sam covered a billion miles his own way, and my, my sort of strategy was to hit counties. And so um, I, was, I was checking off the ones along the Columbia River, uh, you know, uh, is it Klickitas? I should know, shouldn't I? Kittitas and uh, Stevenson and Wakayakum and a number of those. So, so one of one of my evenings on this sort of four night tour that I took was at the Stevenson Library in the little town of Stevenson. Beautiful, gorgeous um, little town right on on the banks of the Columbia. And uh, I read with uh, two other local readers, and one of those was was uh, Mario Milosevic who is, happens to be the librarian, one of the librarians at Stevenson Library, but he's also a really fine 
writer. And so um, the story begins with watching him read this really terrific poem, which I'm going to share with you. Um, and I, I read this poem. You know, he, he sent it to me, and I published it in my blog. I have this blog called The Far Field, where I tried to publish a, a large number of poets from all over the state. It was a great activity for me because it allowed me to reach people that I couldn't maybe reach in other ways. So Mario sent me this poem as, as I requested and I got a lot of nice um, feedback from it. And then I took the poem to Tokeland, which is out on the coast, in January and I was reading poems and that was one of the ones I read to great fanfare and afterwards one of the folks at the reading came up and said, I, you know, I'm an illustrator and I would love to illustrate that book, so, you know, that poem as a book. And so I got the two of them together and, you know, it's just little things like that that are, you, you have the sense that you're kind of connecting this person and that person that you, you can't, you just can't say enough about what that, what that gives me, that sense that I have really kind of felt like a fat part of the fabric. And, and I'll never forget that. That's the best thing about that two years is, is feeling like I'm connecting this person to that person, giving this poem to that person who didn't know they needed it until they heard it. And that just really feels good. So anyway, this is Mario Milosevic's poem, When I Was. When I was a bear, I filled the world. My paws were wide and I walked large. I ate all summer and slept all, all winter, dreaming of the time when I was a dragonfly and I woke the world, darting through air, skimming over grass, hovering on water, my compound eyes embroidering my dreams of the time when I was a turtle and I carried the world, walking slowly with the weight, squat body on four thick legs, hard shell holding me in, keeping my dreams of the time when I was a salmon and I fed the world, Sleek skin sliding down river throats, pink flesh nourishing my cousins. I swam upstream where death took me and I swallowed my dreams of the time when I was a tree and I held the world. Roots gripping soil, branches embracing sky, my vision encompassing dreams of the time when I was a raven and I sang the world. Single notes struck from my throat, pushed into air, the sound a call to listen to the unseen and honor my dreams of the time when I was a bear, when I was a dragonfly, when I was a turtle, a salmon, a tree, when I was a raven. Uh, one, of, one of my um, joys and sort of self-assignments was to create readings around the state, and um, I had I I helped um, put together a reading at the Nisqually Tribal Library about a year ago, a year and a half ago, and I invited three wonderful Native poets: um, uh, Dana Dickerson, who's a young man uh, who lives in Tacoma area, and then Gail Tremblay, who who has taught for years and years at Olympia, mostly as a fabric artist, but she's she's an amazing poet. And um, and Dwayne Nyatum, who's also a really gifted poet. Um, and to get the three of them together reading, and, and it was a, a lovely evening. And it was, unfortunately, it's one of those things. Sometimes things are well attended, and sometimes they are not so well attended. But the fact that they had not all met each other and got to meet that night, and we had a conversation afterwards, and they sort of established um, a relationship with each other, that felt more important in some ways than having a big audience. And, and I, it was great because I got to be there. I got to be part of the audience. So I thought I would, just in sort of honor of that evening, I wanted to read one of Gail Tremblay's poems from her book, Indian Singing. Um, and this is com called Comparing Sockeye and King Salmon. It starts as soon as you get the fish home. Take it out of the bag and start to prepare it to cook. The sockeye has a darker coral color, flesh more beautiful than the petals of the quince flowers whose floral elegance ushers in the spring. One wonders what can make this thin slab of muscle so bright the color almost quivers in the hand. And when one turns the fish over, the skin glints 
a lively silver side against a blue-black black back that seems to make the silver glitter in the sun. This slab of salmon gives you pleasure before you even get it in the pan. Next to sockeye, a piece of king is thick and pale. The color is gentle, like pink beads of angel skin coral, or the flowers of a rare coral peony whose petals fade to a delicate creamy color that blends pink and pale orange in a way difficult to describe. The skin of king is also paler, the broad belly iridescent white, the side a less scintillating silver, the back more ordinary shades of black and charcoal gray. But the weight of this big slab of fish is pleasing in the hand. One feels the greater distance that the swimmer traveled, the magic that allowed him to grow to such a size. The cooking is a delicate affair. King goes into the oven longer, thin sockeye for less than 15 minutes or it's dry. One checks early, impatient for the moment when the flesh is moist but cooked enough so the layers of fish will separate easily, revealing the row of long, fine bones that one stacks on the edge of the plate before slipping the tender pieces of fish between the teeth. This moment is pure chemistry, the instant of pleasure that makes eating art instead of merely feeding the gut. The tongue searches for subtle differences. What is it beside color that separates the sockeye from the king? The sockeye has a slightly finer grain. Fish melts inside your mouth and oils create a delicate bouquet that titillates the taste buds so each bite slips down the throat, a pungent pleasure one longs to repeat. But oh, the king is slightly sweeter, layers thicker, the grain so startlingly smooth. Each bite has a succulence that makes sense celebrate the difference. In the end, it's all desire. <laughs> I'm going to do one more of these. Um, Sam was talking about how difficult it is to get books published, and I think it just grows more and more difficult rather than less with all our publishing options available to us. Um, one, uh, every once in a while you come across a poet that, you, you know, at some point you think, okay, I've met all the poets now, right? <laughs> I know them all. There isn't anybody I've met. Well, that, no, that's never true. Um, through the blog, uh, The Far Field, I, I got to see some, you know, poets that I had never encountered before. And, and so I, I discovered one, um, a, a poet named Donald Mitchell who lives up in Deming um, near Bellingham and lives on a homestead that his it's his family homestead that they had in their family for 130 years, which I think is unusual. And he hasn't bothered with finding publishers. He just publishes them, you know, he self-publishes. And um, I, I just kind of fell in love with his poems. And so I wanted to, it was really hard to come up with one, but I, I wanted to read one of his tonight, too. People You Should Know About. This is called In the Old Cherry Orchard. Clear late March evening, I forget which century. I do know this road is mucky after a long winter rain. Dusk robins are ringing their iron bells around the old cherry field. The winter thrushes are still here. They trill and purr in the young stands of alder, refusing to follow their cold doppelganger to the north. It's hard for me to blame them. Even my dog lies in the new pins of grass, poking up through the crushed baskets of the dead. She's chewing on her new green stick and doesn't care about the white house at the top of the hill. My boots sink into the happy moss. I don't want this life to change any more than you do. I don't want to get jazzed up to go on a trial for all the bandied crimes of the purpose ridden. What I see now and what I cannot see live here together. I'm no saint. I'm an anxious man, always plugging his ears to the grinding sound of God's big can opener. But now, in this little woodland prairie, I think I've decided that the Lord of brave and earnest action may kiss my ass. <laughs> I'm not letting this poem go anywhere or do anything. <laughs> Okay, so I think what I'll do is I'm, I'm going to read you one long poem by me. 
Um, I, you know, Sam, Sam has it on me, 44 years, that's a long time. I've been married 28, and if you count how long we dated, I've been with my husband for 32 years. It's not 44, but it is 32. Um, so this is, I'm also writing, I'm, I'm writing about long love, um, and I'm writing about love of America right now. This is some of the things that I'm trying to think about. And I don't know where those two come together, but I know those paths cross somewhere. And so I'm just writing toward wherever that is that that intersection happens and hope for the best. Uh, but this is, this is a, a long poem um, about marriage. Um, and it's from my husband, Steve. And it's called Night Train from Salzburg. I think most of us are sort of of an age here. <laughs> and we remember going to Europe and where uh, back in those, it doesn't happen so much now, but in those days, people actually took night trains and you slept on the train. Uh, now they have these fast trains or they have really cheap flights, so it just doesn't happen. Young travelers now don't, don't do the couchette thing, but, but we, did, we did the couchette thing one, one night from a train take from Salzburg to the Jungfrau in Switzerland. And it's amazing how memory kind of takes things away. There's things you remember and things you don't remember. And my husband has kind of forgotten this story, and so this is me telling him the story. <laughs> Night train from Salzburg. It was 27 years ago, and just one leg of our six-week European tour you are forgiven for remembering Salzburg, then Blink, the Jungfrau in Switzerland, but nothing of how we traveled from one to the other. It was midnight. We reserved two couchettes in a second-class compartment. The conductor lectured us severely. We didn't understand a word, then slipped into a dark room, humid with sleeping. Our eyes adjusted to the window light. One empty top bunk one middle, the rest occupied. The rest, my private discovery. A crisp Germanic sheet, one blanket, one pillow. The impression of you invisible in the bunk above me, settling yourself and your pack. Four strangers rhythmic breathing, like four tangled silver chains I worked to separate. Our train pulling away from the station. Then your breath, braided in. I slept fitfully, surrounded by slumbering as we threaded along the Alps. Gadum gadum, gadum gadum. I imagined the train tracing the contours of a charming relief map, punctuated with pictures of Wiener Schnitzel, tidy geraniums in window boxes, felt hats, and precision folding knives. <laughs> Finally, the scene outside began to lighten and I could discern occasional smudges transforming into Swiss chalets, dark dots which became, much later, sweet brown cows with bells around their necks. Gadum gadum, gadum gadum, the wayfarer's perfect song. The mountains lightened from gray into green, deep in a high valley, as though we'd been dropped into a diorama or a viewmaster's stereoscopic slide. And for that while, not dark, not light, as I floated between my life and what it might become, you slept and kept sleeping. You were part of the others with their easy breathing, not part of me. Long marriage is predicted by patterns of call and response. One sees a goldfinch out the window and comments. The other responds with an interested, oh, one suggests an article in the newspaper, and the other is pleased because she missed it and says so. Not passion, the experts say. Not probing each other's deaths. Just human birdsong. Today you said it rained on your bike ride home, and I asked your, if your old jacket kept you dry. I was thinking in the back of my mind it might be a thoughtful present for your birthday. Then I looked up. You were wet to the skin and drenching the kitchen floor. Gadum gadum, gadum gadum, gadum gadum. When the cabin lightened enough, my eyes made out the bunks, then finally the sleepers. Someone lay next to me, and each silver breath taken was a link that tugged me closer, close enough to touch, 
intimate and strange at once. Memory erased, was it man or woman, old or young? Just a stranger. And yet that sleeping figure under a blanket occupies a treasured place in my story of our courtship. And if I don't yet know why, I'll keep remembering until I puzzle it out. On our last day in Salzburg, we'd both been out of sorts. Too much togetherness, perhaps. And the weight of knowing this long trip was a dry run for a life together. If it went well. And so we'd squabbled all afternoon. We sat on a bench overlooking the Salzach River. The rest is a blank except Mozartium Hall, which I remember as lemon yellow, ornamented with white meringue, chamber music as warm as varnished scroll work, and something in the glittering space above my head, a meeting of question marks that had trailed me for days. We can both recall meals we shared more than half our lives ago, thinly sliced salmon in Avignon, the black, black gravy in a cassoulet, our midnight supper on the left bank, not what we ate, but that customers kept piling in in the middle of the night, even as we were leaving, the prawns in Soho, our morning option in North England of orange juice or cornflakes, and the couple in Popero who served us and thanked us as they lay each course down, which prompted us to thank them, which prompted them to thank us for thanking them. <laughs> when a marriage partner dies or leaves, how do you calculate the loss? Beyond the familiar voice, the habit, shared chores, the other's body to scent and warm the bed, rhythms of mood, a pattern of likes and concerns, of tuna fish and birthday cake requests a certain quality of junk in the junk drawer, coaxing the garden into compliance, an attitude with a handsaw, the mouth sounds of frustration, of boredom, sacred litanies, a texture to his thinning hair, his capable and beautiful hands, his memory of my parents who are gone, our tiny babies in his arms. The great loss is the other's memories of your past, your better half who sometimes remembered what you forgot. I call you as I'm preparing our dinner, but you're lost in that vague state that passes as hard of hearing, but is more like traveling alone through an abstracted landscape of horizon and careful brushwork. There was that extra hour after the world seemed fully light, Still, you all kept sleeping as I watched the Alpine postcards rushing by. Beautiful cliches, impossible green meadows dotted with blooms, but at each charming chalet, I sensed complicated inner lives. Then the conductor saved me with a knock and woke us all and turned our beds into seats. The six of us returned to our compartment, exhausted, and tried not to stare at each other. Six months later, you proposed and confessed you'd meant to ask that afternoon in Salzburg, on that bench by the river, where we argued instead. <laughs> that figure in the couchette beside me that I can't remember and can't forget, it was possibly me in some parallel life, sleeping easily with her different decisions. Or it was the you I've tried to create who has only ever been a creation. Or it was someone I'll never meet as much or as little as that means. In any case, I walked off the train with you, both of us hauling our heavy packs full of trinkets to take home and torn maps of foreign countries. Thank you. So. We've been told to perch <laughs> on the edge of the auditorium. We're going to take questions.
I love how, you know, both of you had so much travel and topography in your work. You know, I just felt like I went around the whole state and, and, and a little bit of going into Europe as well. <laughs> but, but just, I had all this, you know, there, there was so much movement. And um, I enjoyed both of that. Did you choreograph this together? Or? No, not at all. Not at all. Well, I think you, you handled that well, that, that came across. I just wanted to recommend that you could repeat we don't have okay. cordless mic. Could you repeat the question for people in the back? So, so Janet was saying that she admired that, that we both, in our work t tonight, had a lot of movement and geography and topography that we, and she wondered if we had, you know, conspired and <laughs> we didn't. It was, it was an honest accident. <laughs> we don't have time. <laughs> it's a big state. You know, this, you know, we don't have time. I, one of the things, you know, that it changed for me when I went into this role and coming out of the role. One of the things when I, when I before I got onto this this track, um, I was a person who always I was very diligent about practicing my readings and I would practice and I was nervous nervous enough that I would practice my patter between, you know, I mean, I would actually include that, I would try to think of things to say, and I would think about how to say them, and then I'd say them a lot of really terrible ways, and then find a better way to say them, and so that was just part of how I prepared. I didn't have time to do that anymore, and um, I, I know you've talked about being a shy person, I don't know if that's a secret. I actually am. Yeah, and I'm not a shy person, but I'm kind of introverted and not a, not comfortable in front of an audience. So we've had to adjust. Well, there are more people in this room right now that I've seen on my island in the last six months. So, uh, yeah. One of the things that happened, especially because of the job, you want to maximize your time. So. You know, you're moving across the state, you're thinking, okay, let's see, I could stop and visit a school in, in Ellensburg, and then hmm, maybe I could get a, I could read over there in those life, and then I could do that. And so a lot of it is saying yes to things you have no idea really what you're saying yes to. So I would, I would, I went to, uh, to give a reading at, at Central, and I, I said, well, I'll, I'll do the reading there only if you find me a high school to visit in the morning. So, so that's great. So I, I went in and I visited a high school, talked to three classes, then I skipped over to Central. Then somebody else, well, I, we need you to, to do a television. So I did an hour TV thing first. And then some other professor said, but could you talk to Mike? So I talked to that class. Then I gave another reading for the faculty. And then I finally did the reading in the evening. By the time I got to the evening reading, which was the whole point of the trip, <laughs> I had already you know, read and talked with several hundred people. And I, there was no way to plan. So you just go and say, okay, whatever. <laughs> Once I got a phone call from somebody who said, could you talk to a group of people, of, of educators, who are dealing with children with special needs? And I said, sure, when? And, and they told me the date, and I said, well, where? And it was at the, the convention center. And I said, oh, sure, that's the day I'm leaving Seattle University for the end of the quarter, and I'll just fit that in on my way north. So I, I found the place, and as I'm going up the escalators, I see all these people with, with carrying cases, and I realize that there's some convention going on. Then I get shown to a green room <laughs> with the mayor and all kinds of other, and then I, I begin to think, oh, wait a minute, this is not, I'm, I'm the opening act, and, and, and 5,000 people. And, and um, you know, they have those TV screens with your, your, so people can see you. And I'm sitting in there thinking, oh, Jesus, just don't let me pass out. And, you know, I, I the, and it, it was grand, but no time to worry. So we did, we had to do a lot of that. Yeah, you, you just sort of think on your feet. You don't have time to get nervous. You don't have time to worry about it. You just do it. And I have grown from that experience. It's, it's yeah. Really, it's been life-altering for me. And people are generous, of course. That's the other thing, is that they're there for poetry. And it doesn't matter if one person comes or 5,000 people come. Um, I, I did a reading in Soap Lake on election night because the people who organized it forgot. <laughs> that beautiful little theater in Soap Lake, four people. And, and one of them fell asleep. <laughs> 
studio and she, she, she went out cold and she was snoring. And none of us had the heart to wake her up. And so, you know, it was, and it was a lovely reading. I, I mean, I, I had a grand time reading for the people and uh, she came the next night to another reading 40 miles away because she was so embarrassed when she woke up and, and she had a grand time. Um, there was just no time. My, my journey from engineer to poet is, um, it was gradual, so in between engineer and poet was stay-at-home mother, so, you know, invisible person. Um, I, so I was working as an engineer, I worked part-time while my first son was born, then with the second son born, I left work temporary, I, I was on leave, like leave forever, but I was on leave and taking care of the kids, and I... I needed things to do in the evenings, and so I, t I took a class on handwriting analysis, I took a class on jazz piano improvisation, and one of the classes I took was on poetry writing, because I had been starting to check out books of, library, uh, books of poetry from the library and really enjoying them. So I took this class on poetry writing um, at the UW Experimental College, I was 32 years old, and I fell madly in love with it. And um, from then on, it's just a matter of, you know, stages. At first, I couldn't tell my friends I was embarrassed that I was writing poetry. I didn't <laughs> let them know. And then there's a stage where you let, kind of let loose that, oh, I'm writing. And then there's the stage where, okay, I think I'll start sending work out. And it starts to get published in teeny tiny magazines. And, you know, so it was a very gradual process. Uh, then I think the part that helped me sort of, the, the, when do you start calling yourself a poet? Well, for me, some of it came from actually making some money, and, and I, I had been volunteering in my kids' schools, t doing little poetry workshops with them, and then I got onto the roster at Washington State Art, Arts Commission as a, as a teaching artist, and started to make a little bit of money as a teaching writer, um, and that helped me, and then I got a grant, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very gradual process. It was a period of a, um, about 15 years. Um, between that start and when my first book came out. So, you know, it's a very slow, slow process. We have very different paths. So, Sam has a great story about, like, reciting poems at four, age four in the back seat of the car or something, right? <laughs> I didn't have that. That was not my story. If any of you want to hear a Robert Service poem, I'm here, man. <laughs> I can do the cremation of Sam McGee with, without liquor. You know where I heard the cremation of Sam McGee? I, there was a, an event at, in Bickleton. You know where Bickleton is? Yeah. Yeah, it's the Bluebird yeah. capital of the universe. Yeah. And yeah. it's um, just south of Zilla, I think yeah, it is. Yeah, Clickitack County. Yeah, Clickitack County. <laughs> and um, so they, we, I visited the school with my friend uh, Juniper White, who has a little traveling um, letterpress printer. And she met all the kids in the school and did letterpress printing with them, and I met all the kids and did poetry writing with them. And then that evening, at the Grange Hall, we had a poetry program that included five students who recited Yeats and Wordsworth, and, and just, they were amazing. They brought the crowd. There was like... 60 people there in a town of 99 um, and a fellow there he recited this cremation of Sam McGee and Gallipoli um, uh, and for you know for the appreciative audience it was it was a terrific evening. I think one of the things that, that happened for both of us uh, throughout this tour I mean we've, we've been involved with poetry forever I've been publishing for way more than 40 years now and it's, I was explaining to somebody earlier, I'm like that guy that knows about nothing but spiders. You know, they can tell you anything about any kind of spider, but they don't know anything about anything else. I'm that guy, except it's poetry for me. I, I don't know anything about spiders, but poetry. I love that. And I think that we discovered that there are people are hungry for this. They just don't know they are. I, I got asked early on if I was an evangelist, like I was supposed to convert people. I said, absolutely not. That's not my job, is to convince somebody they should love something. My job is to convince people that maybe they've said no without knowing what they've said no to. And the fact of the matter is, is that um, our job isn't to tell people what they shouldn't love. And 
I, I love the fact that poetry is so huge. Donald Hall says it's like the, like the belly of a shark, poetry. It contains everything. And that's a fact. So you, it's, it's wonderful to meet people who love Robert Service or who love cowboy poetry, but maybe they're like a little Allen Ginsberg, maybe they're a little Charles Bukowski crazy, but it doesn't really matter. The notion is, is that language is there, and language helps us deal with the issues that make us human. And we, it's how we explain things not only to ourselves, but to our loved ones, our neighbors, and other people, and poetry can do that. It's there for us. But most people see it as this other thing they're taught as, as scholars in school. It's this artifact to undress. It's this orange to take the rind off of and to describe. When it's much, much bigger than that, and much more useful than that. So all around the state, I would encounter people who would come up, and I know this has happened to you, come up after a reading and say, oh my God, my mother dragged me here, kicking and screaming. I came with this girl that I think I liked, and I, I thought I didn't want her to think I you know, didn't, wouldn't go with her. But that was good. So uh, does anybody else do that? And they just don't, you know, they're hungry for it, but they don't know they're hungry. And that was a, that was a big thing, to be that emissary. And to, to say to some old guy who comes up thinking you're going to be a snob and saying, yeah, well, I bet you don't know. And I, I did this at a, at a fundraising thing for Skagitonians to preserve farmland. And there was this old guy who wasn't very interested in poetry at all, and he was there because his wife made him be there. And then, you know, he mentioned something about Robert Service, and I recited the entire shooting of Dan McGrew. <laughs> and he wrote a big check. <laughs> He said, he was surprised, like, really, you can like, yes, we can like all of that, because poetry is big enough to contain all of it, and you don't have to love exactly what somebody else loves. It, you know, it's very hard to come up with, but I, one of the things I came up with on my tour was talking about it like music, you know, you, you, you have a dial full of radio stations that have different kinds of music, or we used to. And um, you're not expected to like every kind of music that you hear. And it's just that poetry is exactly the same. It's just you have to, it, you have to work a little harder to find your station, you know. But it's out there somewhere. And then when you hear it, you're going to fall in love. And saying no to a genre is ridiculous. No, I never read science fiction. <laughs> You've never read Lois Bujold, you know, who's an amazing writer. <laughs> and I, I mean, don't say no to country western. There's some great country western songs. Yeah. It's also some of the worst stuff ever. <laughs> but maybe it won't be the worst stuff forever. That the what the gods of your childhood won't be the gods of your old age. You know, I I used to read Shakespeare, the sonnets when I was young, and think, God, what a whiner! <laughs> what? Jesus, get over it, Bill. But I'm I'm 65 now, and now I read. That time of year thou mayest in me behold, when yellow leaves, or none, or few, do hang upon these boughs that shake against the cold, bare, ruined choirs, where late the sweet birds sang, worried about dying, worried about leaving the beloved behind. And I read that poem, or say it to myself sometimes in my sleep, and I cry with, and think, oh my God, how did you get that? You are so right. And it's so useful to have that, to go to, and to then use that as a springboard into trying to explain your own feelings to yourself. Jesus, I, I can't imagine that. But at the time, it's like, Jesus, give me a rest. <laughs> well, I think we're, here we are in an art museum, and it's about looking at, at these pieces that are done with various media, and, and yet, Language, of course, is a media. It's a, you know, it's you use, you know, it's you may not be dipping it into a, a certain pigment, but you are using a word and you're choosing a word. And, and I think we're flooded by language in our society, and yet it's what we all use it all the time. It's, it's basically an art form that we all are using. And could we, if we pay attention and we listen, we might choose and, and, and listen, listen more closely and not use this cliche or use it well and use it better and make it make fun of it or you know I think that paying attention is what poetry is about you know and yeah. and listening so we're going to repeat that <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, she's essentially saying that we need to, we have we have this tool at hand. Yeah, everybody and uses it. Everybody uses everybody. it. Everybody. But everybody knows the frustration of it too, right? How many of you? How many of you have ever been telling the absolute truth to someone and they did not believe you? <laughs> right? How many of you have ever seen something really cool, really wonderful, and tried to share it with someone else and they didn't get it? <laughs> yes. And we are well-meaning people mostly. 44 years together, Sally and I, we know each other really well. And we can look into one another's eyes and talk and misunderstand or fail to get across what the other one is thinking. And we're, we use language. That is, that's the human condition. We are, for all of our sociability, isolated in our own heads. We, no, we don't have the technology yet where we can just take a jack, stick it in our head, stick it in the other head, and say, <laughs> okay. okay, download this. <laughs> and wouldn't that be cool in a way? What we have, though, we have language. And language can get us close. And to fail to, to uh, appreciate the possibilities of it is to fail to take advantage of something that's there for all of us. It's, it's our heritage. We have it. Um, and I, personally, I hate that frustration of not being able to get it across. So coming close, that's worth trying for. Yeah, I'm curious about your life on Waldron Island and how, <laughs> yeah, Waldron, how does that work for you? You seem like a social person and, and I, I know you have your wife there, but... Um, I'm not. Um, <laughs> actually, I belong in an island. Does that I, I do. Your no, I, 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 I love people. I really do. I wish them well. I just, <laughs> I just uh, I'm, I'm, as I tell my friend, I'm not a fun guy. I'm not a party guy. I'm, I'm a thoughtful guy. I, I, I'm happier reading than I am, you know, visiting and stuff. So I, I'm, I like being, I like isolation. I like that. I love teaching. I love, I love to do it, you know, I'm a guerrilla warfare teacher. I go out and hit the wagon train and then run off into the hills. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not the guy that stays there full time. And I, I've been teaching classrooms for 38 years now. I've taught in uh, thousands of classrooms, tens of thousands, tens of tens of thousands of kids. And um, I, every time I make sure they know their teacher is a hero and I'm not. Because they're there every day and I go away. So living in an island, I, I mean, you, we all live in islands in a way too, don't we? We're, we're isolated in our certain ways, our homes, our rooms, our thoughts, or, or whatever. For us, it's just a physical place. But it, we moved there for community. We wanted to feel what it was like to live in a place where everyone knew everyone and where you had no choice but to deal with each other. Hmm. So and it was also economic. We wanted to know what was it like if... if uh, Overhead, right? We were living in North Seattle, making lots of money, it seems like, doing jobs we hated. And uh, one day it occurred to us that, hmm, if we, if we didn't have this overhead, we wouldn't have to make that money. So we reversed the American dream. We got poor. Mm -hmm. But then we had more disposable income than we ever had in our lives by, re by reducing what we needed. Mm -hmm. So we just didn't have to have the jobs. How cool was that? So we got to be with each other. It turns out we like each other a lot. Enough to be together 24 hours a day. Enough to see our son any time when he came home from school. His parents were both there. So Waldron was a good place for us. It, it, it was. It's not a good place for everybody. But it's also a good place for being a poet, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah and by the way, all poets don't have to live in exotic places. <laughs> you can write poems on the bus. You can write poems in a, in a chair in the back of the room. It just means moving the pen across the page. That's all a writer. A writer's write. They don't just think about writing. How do you get on and off the island? Air, air, um, air taxi or uh, or water taxi. Yesterday, Sally and I caught you know caught a, a water taxi, meaning one of our neighbors charges money to take us to another island where there's a ferry. We could get to the mainland where we keep a car. Um, and then we were loose on the main, on the world like you are. <laughs> we, we can do regular things. And then we go back and we'll park our car and then we'll take the ferry back and then we'll catch this taxi and then we'll get home and then we won't see anybody. Like we won't be out here for a while. 
when I was laureate, I, I actually the first year I was I was doing the poet laureateship, I think I figured out I slept in my bed 90, 90 times, mm -hmm. 90 nights. The rest of it I was off, off in some motel room, really waking up. I'm sure, did this happen to you? Did you ever wake up and say, where the hell am I? <laughs> I, did, I, did. No, I don't think I did. I don't think uh, I did quite as much traveling as you did. I, my, or mine was more. I don't know, in little clumps, maybe. I think you were just like splat all over the place. Because I'm the so place. unorganized. <laughs> Kathleen was an. Kathleen was an amazing poet laureate. She was. I when I heard that she had been named, I was so relieved. I was so happy. And, uh, oh man, this is going to be good. Could you explain how you become? How does one become a poet laureate in this state? What's the process? I think it's kind of a brilliant program because it, it's actually a job application. Mm -hmm. um, and so they get the word out as much as they can um, to the poetry community that this there's a, an open period for, for applications. And they ask you to propose projects that you'd like to work on. So they're not only reviewing your work as a poet, as a poetry citizen, somebody who's bringing, you know, working with, with other poets and trying to promote poetry and, and writing poetry, but then they want to see what you're going to do as Poet Laureate. So that's part of the, part of the process is, is they're vetting not just you, but, but what it is you want to do. And I think that's really smart. And when they choose somebody, that person is going to want, is going to feel passionate about what it is they are going to do. They're not going to do somebody else's job. They're going to do their job and do it the way they want to do it. It's all self-motivated. I think there was, there was a misconception, especially at the beginning, about what this was about. When it was first announced that there was going to be a Poet Laureate, and it took the efforts of a whole bunch of people to push this through. People have been working on getting the position established for decades, actually, and it had been shot down, shot down, shot down. Finally, they got it approved. And then they posted a, an application process. And the idea that you would apply to become the Poet Laureate, when the notion was that, wow, to be Poet Laureate is this, it's this great honorific. And how in the world, I, I wrote a little book about it, about my two years as Laureate to raise, help raise money. And in it I said, geez, how would you apply to be honored? And how in the world would somebody like me apply to be the Poet Laureate of Washington State when David Wagner's still alive? Or Heather McHugh? Or Richard Kenny? Or Linda Beards? Or, and I have a whole long list of people I would be behind in the line. If it were, if it were that, if it were, let's honor this poet. But then I read it, and it said it's a job description. Like here's a job. This is the title of the job. And then I, I read the job description. And I said, well, hell, I've been doing that all my life. I could do that. And it's okay if I apply as a job. And remember that it is a job, and that the mandate, the way, because I got to invent it, and the mandate for me was, I'm representing other poets. And Kathleen did that as well. We're representing others. It's, it's not about us. It's not about look and admire me. Because poetry is more important than the poets, I think, anyway. I mean, of course, we all want our poems to be read. But poetry is what matters. And it matters because you guys read it. This, the reader is way more important than the writer. For heaven's sake, that we write for readers. Not so somebody will say, look at me. I'm there's, so sensitive. There's fewer readers than writers. <laughs> sure. Sam and Kathleen, I just want to thank you for, I know we'll need to uh, wrap up pretty soon here, and so we have time to um, sign books and um, purchase books from the booksellers. Um, but thank you for a lovely evening of poetry and insight and inspiration. I just feel so inspired by being able to hear from both of you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And uh, thank you. Thank you.